Hello, and welcome back for another edition of the AI Insiders podcast, the flagship podcast, kind of making it up as we go along, which let's face it, also kind of makes sense since we're living in a world in which things seem to be changing on a weekly basis. And we're making it up also means you are willing to change your mind uh, because I can talk about how the world is now. And hey, presto, it's different. But by that, I mean, uh, I'm most excited about this podcast because as director of the AI division at the University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute, I have the opportunity to talk to lots of people who are doing AI at ISI and USC, and in particular, up and coming talent. These are the folks who are not only cutting their teeth on AI, but they're gonna be the ones that we're gonna depend on to help make sense of this stuff. And they have the enviable or unenviable task, depending on who you ask, of helping to try and navigate us through these uh, quote unquote interesting times, which I think will depend on having interesting people. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking my chance to talk to my interesting colleagues to better understand how they're thinking about the state of the world, where we're headed, where we should be headed, and what they're hoping to do to help us head that way. One such interesting person is Rebecca, aka Becca Dorn. She is a PhD candidate currently in computer science at the Information Sciences Institute as well. And she is my guest on AI Insiders podcast today. Welcome, Becca. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so, so here you are, and I want you not to be here. I want you to go back in time. And I want you to talk to your somewhere around 8, 10, 12-year-old self and explain to 8, 10, 12-year-old Becca, what are you doing here? And what are you working on? Whoa. Well, first, I think my 8 to 12-year-old self would be really disappointed that I'm not a pop star, but oh. <laughs> that aside. <laughs> uh, our, our, collective, our our 12-year-old selves can get together and, and form a support group. Uh, yeah. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. so not a pop star yet. Yeah. Um, so the way I'm looking, what I'm working on right now is the data that people are using for machines, how like historical systems of inequity become embedded in that data and like how that propagates into downstream applications. I don't know if 12 year old me would understand. I was going to ask, would your 12 year old self say like, oh, inequity? Sure. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so, no. so, so, let's tell it to a 12 year old. What is inequity and why is it bad? Yeah, I guess what I would say is we just want to make sure that like the things that we're building really do kind of work towards a better world as opposed to just continuing to deal the same that was continuing to deal the same cards over and over again, if that makes sense. The classic example I typically use is like policing, right? We know that police have historically over policed black neighborhoods. That's a fact, you know? Um, and then if we take these like predictive policing models where in real time police are like taking that historical data and saying, oh, these neighborhoods in our in the past have seemed really violent according to our crime records. Like we should be sending more cops there. So then we end up creating more data that perpetuates like- There'll be more arrests because pass. more cops. Yeah, exactly. And that I think that kind of is an intuitive way to like capture what I try to do. Although it's not necessarily for the black community. Um, I've been focusing a lot on like gender queer communities and what it looks like for them. And yeah. It's, I have a lot of fun. It's fun. I get to like poke and prod at different machines. <laughs> okay. But you wanted to be a pop star at 8, 10, 12. How did you <laughs> end up here in, in AI? Well, okay. For me, growing up, there were always two things that were really, that were stressed to me was important as I like become an adult in the world looking for jobs and work. And those are A, to do something that I really love and B, to help people. And as long as I'm doing those two things, like I'm good to go and the rest will sort itself out. So it was clear to me I wanted to do something kind of involving equity, but I I went to college and like took my first computer science class and I was like, oh, like this is my stuff. This is my jam, you know, like this is so fun. (laughs) What was it about computer science? It was like the little puzzles, you know, and like also just, there was like an energy in that room of people who were so excited to do those puzzles and like figuring it out together. And there was such a community, um, which is something I also really vibe with. And later on, I found Christina Ellerman and Fred Morstadter who take the aspects of computer science that I find really fun and mm-hmm. apply them to questions of equity. And I was like, that is, that's where I want to be. Interesting. You you did talk um, about, you know, finding, finding kind of community. You know, the thing about being part of a community is, is almost in some cases like being part of a team. And one question I like to ask, as I increasingly appreciate how much of a team sport like AI is, right? Especially AI for good. What do you think is your superpower that you kind of bring to a team? Hmm. I think something that I bring is 
honestly, I think I, I really value community. And I think one of the things that I bring to the table is yes, I can work independently, but also like, I like to bridge ideas together, right. And see what different perspectives are going on. And like no singular perspective is a waste of like time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My other superpower is begging my advisors to take us to an escape room because they're so fun. And it's worked. It works. <laughs> All right. Note, note to self. Um, the work you've been doing, um, again, with, with Fred and Christina, we've, we've had both on, which is great. Uh, and they're actually part, strong reasons why, why I came to ISI. I want to ask, what have you found in the work you've done that's been most sort of counterintuitive or surprising? What have you done where you thought, I did not see that coming? That's every time you do any research, right? You go in with one hypothesis and the results are completely different. And you're like, wait, I'm so confused. One of the things was we did, I had this data set of tweets from non-binary people, specifically using the pronouns in their biographies, which anyway, I think is really cool because we never have self-identified gender data, right? Like mm -hmm. it's so usually people take someone's first name or their face, like, which totally excludes trans people and non-binary people. Um, but anyway, so we, anyway, <laughs> so I have this data set of non-binary people and we looked at emotions in the tweets and we found that people with non-binary pronouns have like higher levels of like love and joy as opposed to people with binary pronouns. And we were kind of expecting to see some kind of like maybe mental health crisis going on or something like that. And instead we found this, we saw this like evidence of queer joy, which was really fun. That's interesting. Yeah. It was kind of a cool thing. But at first I was like, what is going on? Oh, so you were worried like, well, we just didn't do the math right. Yeah, exactly. That's always my first intuition is I'm like, let me read, let me reread this code. <laughs> That is a that is a strong scientific vein. Please keep that muscle going because there are a lot of people think like, oh sweet, I got something I can publish and just move out. And like, oh, let's let's make sure it's real. Um, uh, this this notion of things like joy, for example, you know, as an anthropologist, I've long been uh, I've, I've seen AI as a way forward to what I call qualitative research. Like we can do things at quantitative scales, but we still don't want to lose like you know the qualitative nature of this stuff of what it's like to be a person in the world. Mm. Um, I don't know if we're there yet. But how do you feel about that? Do you think do you think AI is really giving us insights into like people's emotional lives and and at, at scales we couldn't have before, or do you think it's still pretty on the surface? I think it's a mix, definitely. I don't think AI is everything, and I don't think AI is nothing. I think when it comes to looking at insights about how people act, like AI is really good at telling us like these are the keywords that are popping up. We need a human to take those results and understand what it means, right? We need a human to double check what the output of AI is and say like, this makes sense or like, it, this is just not right. Take like, okay, the other day I was, I was like talking to my doctor about, we were talking about how radiologists are like slowly, you know, getting almost replaced by AI, right? And we were kind of talking about like how scary that is. And he was like, hey, like, but it seems like they're really good at it. And I was like, you need, that's like such a clear example to me of a time when AI can be really good when used as a tool, right? To double check, like, okay, did I check everything in this person's scans, right? But not as a replacement, especially because like we know like medical data also is really biased when it comes to like underdiagnosing women, underdiagnosing people of color, right? Like we know those things. So like we need a person there, but AI is a really helpful tool. Yeah. The let me ask you a, a slightly harder question, which is, do you think AI should be used to like reverse bias those systems? Like if we know that, you know, white doctors tend to underestimate or undervalue, say, African-American pain, um, should those scales be adjusted accordingly to address human bias? Or is that is that opening a, a Pandora's box? Yeah, well, I think, okay, I have many thoughts. One of my big thoughts is that there's like no end goal for AI ethics, right? Like, like the, nobody, there's a reason why the field of philosophy is still around. Nobody solved it. And it's like, this is what's good. And this is what's bad, right? There's always going to be new things popping up that we're going to have to mitigate. Um, and also there's this question that I think we don't always ask, which is, is this domain right for AI? Should we be deploying AI on this domain? And in situations where the answer should be no, but in practical uses, the answer is yes, I think those are like the prime examples for doing some kind of bias mitigation. But I also think you touched on something else, which is like, what would it look like for algorithms to kind of implement reparations of some form? I think that would be really cool and helpful and controversial. 
and, and probably not straightforward. That's I think that's right. Um, so so with that, then what do you what are you most worried about with AI? Honestly, what I'm worried most about is that the regulations will be set by corporations. People, there's a lot of like talk about like, oh, what would happen if the government had our data and like all this stuff? But it's like, that's not the real person to be scared of necessarily, right? Like, because our data is being used specifically to make money off of us and like without regard for our well being. I remember my dad talked about when he was younger and you went to the movie theater, they would show an ad for popcorn in like a millisecond, right? It would just like, pop up on the screen and go away. Like it was subliminal messaging to tell you to go and get popcorn. And then regulations came in being like, that's literally psychological manipulation. Like you can't do that. Well, we have that now on such a large scale, right? Like I download TikTok, I'm unable to delete it, right? I open my phone to scroll for one second. I'm there for so long strictly because people make money when I am there longer and see more ads. um, And we need some kind of regulation and oversight for that. Um, what do you, what do your folks actually think about what you're doing in AI? I think they think it's cool, and I think they have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, why? Well, I mean, just technically. <laughs> yeah, I think. Well, I think. Okay, this is so fun because I love talking. My. <laughs> and, My... and we gave you a microphone, so we asked for it. I know this is awesome. I'm going to take this podcast kit and run. Um, okay, I think a lot of the language we use around AI is like kind of almost it feels almost intentionally built to like seem more convoluted than it is even this notion of like machine learning artificial intelligence natural language processing a lot of the actual concepts are way easier like more people than we think know what linear regression is right like a lot of people know what that is but if you say machine learning it sounds way fancier even though like you know initially machine learning was well it wasn't just linear regression but like that is one of the big building blocks right so I kind of think that, yeah. So I think that's part of the reason why is like the terminology that we have in this field is meant to almost push people out. Almost on purpose. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get it. I'm doing artificial intelligence. You wouldn't understand. Right. right I'm exactly. Teaching, I'm teaching machines how to learn. It's really complicated. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's a great point. They're using language. In, f- in fact, that's sort of, yeah, exclude to some degree. Hmm. Uh, who do you, who do you trust in AI? And you can't say anyone from ISI. So who do you who do you look at and you think that person strikes me as being pretty sane uh and how they talk about AI and what it can and can't do? Emily Bender. Emily oh, Bender. At Washington? Emily yeah. Bender, Washington. Yeah, she's yeah. great. Okay. She's one of those people who I very much rely on what she says about what's going on. And I feel like she has a very level head um, mm-hmm. in assessing what is helpful and what's not. Because a lot of people also like, to be clear, I'm not like down with all AI, you know? I think AI is really, really helpful in the right domains. Let's say AI evolves into a sentient thing. Whoa. We have an opportunity to send Becca to that AI to give that AI some cultural artifact to help the AI better understand human beings. What would you hand it as a way of sort of saying here in just this, and you might get a better sense of kind of who you're dealing with. You can give it a book, a poem, a karaoke song. I don't know. Wow. That's such a crazy question. (laughs) Okay. Well, one thing I would want to give it is Race After Technology, the Ruha Benjamin book, because I feel Mm -hmm. like it could learn from that a little bit about what not to do and stuff and like the history of how it is in its current form. Um, But I also would give it the Twilight book series, probably. (laughs) I'm not letting you off that one. I hear, unpack that for me. I love that. That's one of the best answers I've had. Uh, Why? It all comes back to 12-year-old Becca. (laughs) Oh, okay. It's just learned that vampires are real, probably. I want to see how far we can make that propagate. (laughs) All right. I like it. You're going to poison the uh, the data set and like, then we'll take advantage of it while it's confused. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey, if you had a chance, uh, unfair question, if you had a chance to uh, sit down to dinner with anyone from history, living or dead, that w- you could talk to that might have some, what, I don't know, sage advice or counsel about how to, you know, how to deal with where we are right now in this crazy world, who would that person be and why? This one is breaking my brain. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, can it be a living person? Yeah, absolutely. The researcher Alex Hanna is a sociologist who like studies machine learning frameworks, and I'm totally obsessed with her work. Um, Apparently, all right, Alex, we're coming <laughs> for you. I will, I will get Alex on this on this podcast. Um, okay, but but you you just get a sense like they have a good bead on on how things are working. Yeah, I think this there's like this understanding of like what are what kind of role marginalization plays in building technology and kind of like reframing it almost as like what would it look like to ground it in like something more equitable. Yeah, they, it gets it get, that stuff gets baked in in ways that it's it's hard to hard to convey sometimes. Yeah, like even that I the idea of like I mean, well, data take like even the census data. Like it, there's so much controversy over what gets featured, what doesn't get featured, and again, like there's like this lack of LGBTQ plus data, but also what does it look like to take that data and like essentially create this like database of people with historically marginalized identities, right? And like the risks that play. So there's so much at there and then even like the question of like like race asking people to conceptualize their race as like a checkbox right like that kind of is in that way we by making like race and ethnicity a categorical variable like we're kind of totally stripping it of like so such a rich history that is there and also like such like what the complexity is of individual identities and like community mm -hmm. and things like that yeah and so is it fluid and flexible I, I think it's it is interesting that when you look at the the checkboxes you know, those those are results of decisions we made about how to carve up the world, right? What yeah. categories to use? Then we take that as as empirical objective reality. Yes. Yes. Becca, this is the hardest question of the entire podcast. Do you have a good AI joke? No, I tried to Google one to bring, <laughs> but I I just got a bunch of articles about AI and humor. <laughs> that's I know. I that's the thing. Like it'll tell you like what's funny, like how humor works, but it won't actually yeah. give you a joke. All right, do you have a favorite joke then? And let's see if we can add AI to it. Okay, here's actually this is really my favorite joke. Knock knock. Who's there? Dwayne. Dwayne. <laughs> Dwayne the tub. I'm drowning. That's <laughs> No, I don't All think right, how are we gonna do that? <laughs> knock knock. Who's there? Okay, how about this one? Knock knock. Who's there? Neural. <laughs> Neural. Neural network. <laughs> you see the problem? Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have literally lived out in front of you <laughs> the, the challenge. <laughs> the space. All right. Well, hey, uh, Becca. We I see we're we're coming to time. Uh, I have I think confirmed for myself that you are not in fact a deep fake uh, with, with many of your answers. <laughs> Uh, but I really have genuinely in, enjoyed getting to know you. I mean, obviously we've met before, but, and the work you're doing here is, I mean, just so, so critical that, um, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to to work with you in that space. And, you know, if there's, um, if there's a piece of advice you have for the director of the AI division of the Information Sciences Institute, I would love, I'd love to have it. More escape rooms. <laughs> <laughs> you, you joke. I have gotten lost. And you know, several times it felt just like that. Um, <laughs> but I think I can do that. More escape rooms, indeed. And I will also pull on that. There's got to be an analogy there somehow for where we are right now in the world. More escape rooms. <laughs> anyway, seriously, uh, it's been a pleasure and delight to talk to you. Um, and yeah, thank you again for being part of the ISI community. And thank you for believing how important community is because it's people like you who are going to help us build it further. Yeah, thank you. This has been so fun and silly. <laughs> fun and silly, I think, is actually a good synopsis of it. So if you enjoy these short podcasts, please do what really only you can do. Uh, rate us, score us, evaluate us, grade us, subscribe, spread the word, send us feedback. Uh, seriously, please send us feedback. I love it. Offer up uh, brave and now increasingly silly questions. And of course, just keep listening and learning with the rest of us, please. And join us again for another episode of AI Insiders, where we will keep exploring, keep learning, keep humanizing, and keep searching for a good joke about AI to help navigate our way through this weird, weird world, trying to do what humans do best when they face these kinds of challenges, working together as if all our lives depend on each other, because they do. So for now, for the future, fight on. Mm -hmm.